Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the AFS Cinema. My name is Holly Herrick. I'm head of film at Austin Film Society. I'm so glad to see you all here on this beautiful day. Um, I know it's hard to go inside when suddenly the weather is like this, and yet you will not regret it because you're about to have an amazing experience with this movie. So I wanted to welcome you all to Doc Days, which is our annual festival of nonfiction cinema. We're looking for artistically driven stories that are moving the medium of documentary film forward and celebrating some of the best films of the year sort of as we get to the end of 2021. And so we're really proud of the, the lineup in Doc Days and we have a full final day of films for you to explore starting with the wonderful Fathom which you're about to see today. So if you want to stick around, we've got um, two more films in Doc Days Inside the Red Brick Wall, and finally The Rescue, um, the story of the Thai um, cave rescue from 2018. So stick around the AFS Cinema if you want to dive in further. Um, but today's presentation is so exciting and long awaited. We have been um, following the filmmaker Drew Xanthopoulos um, since early in his career when he started making his first feature film, which Austin Film Society had the opportunity to support through our grant program. AFS gives grants to Texas-based filmmakers to make independent films. We're very proud to support Drew's first film, The Sensitives, which is a must-see, um, and then couldn't wait to see what he was doing with this film about two female whale scientists, and we're just delighted to discover um, this wonderful work. And today, we're proud to present it as a science on screen presentation. This is part of the program supported by the Coolidge Corner Theater and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which allows us to have conversations about science in movies. And so today, following the screening, we'll have Drew up for a Q&A, but we'll also have Michelle Fournay, one of the amazing scientists featured in the film. He'll be joining us via Skype. So please stick around afterwards. We're going to have a great conversation and talk about some of the, the path to discovery that you're going to see in the movie. But it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Drew Santopoulos, the director of Fathom, who's joining us today in Austin, live in person. <laughs> so glad you're here. Welcome, Drew. Um, it, uh, it means like so much to be, you know, I didn't think this would happen. Uh, not even just AFS, but in general to have a film on a big screen with a room full of people and it, 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 especially this room and this place, so many familiar faces. I became a filmmaker in Austin, um, starting with UT, um, with incredible mentors or some of which are here and then lucky enough to you know, work with amazing people who are also um, in this room. So this is a homecoming screening for me that um, means a lot. Uh, and the longer I've done this, the more I've realized how um, indispensable organizations like AFS are. Um, so Holly, thank you for like doing all this and being such a patron of filmmakers. Like this, it's just not, yeah, this doesn't happen everywhere. And AFS is like one of the best in the country. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy the film. I will say that uh, at the end of it, um, you will hear the, the credits that you'll see before we come up for the Q&A. It's a perfectly um, per, like representation of what uh, a whale song sounds like, what a humpback whale song. So I hope you can enjoy that and kind of sit into it after experiencing the movie and, and you're hearing a, um, a clean sort of humpback whale song. It's pretty magical. So um, really look forward to hearing your questions and um, afterward. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Holly, again. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you all during the Q&A. Oh, enjoy Fathom. Welcome back, Drew. And I think Michelle is on her way onto screen here. Um, but congratulations on this incredible Thanks, movie. Um, it was so beautiful to see it on the big screen. Can you tell us, while we're waiting for Michelle, can you tell us, um, you said the song at the end is a single um, whale song? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a single singer. It's, it's from one season. And uh, yeah, there was just a point where we were making the film and it felt like uh, after everything you've experienced and learned in the film that we would just let you just sit. In, in what they're doing and hear it without any manipulation. And so, yeah, it's from, I forget what year it's from, but it's a recording from French Polynesia. Actually, no, that was from the year that we filmed. Some of the songs obviously were from previous seasons that she recorded across time to sort of crack the code, so to speak, but yeah. That's wonderful. I think we can hear Michelle. Hi, everybody. Hi. Here, let's, let's give Michelle a big round of applause. 
<laughs> and I'm, I'm sure we're gonna see you in a second, Michelle. We can't see you yet, um, but thank you so much for joining us. So I think, um, you know, what, there's so much to talk about with this movie, but I, I, I do think, you know, for, for lay people, um, seeing, getting into the inside of field work um, is, you know, there's a real assumption when you read science news where you're like, a team of scientists goes out and you imagine like 20 to 30 scientists and like all kinds of infrastructure. And here we see sort of the reality of the problems and the reality of the size of the team for funded research. Um, so Michelle, I, I just wanted to hear your your thoughts on that. Um, and also Drew, like this, you know, for, for me, the, when I first watched this movie, I was like, oh, <laughs> they have to wait for the engine. <laughs> it's a lot, like, it's a lot uh, like filmmaking, right, Mish? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the same way that Drew had a whole team of, of filmmakers with him, I also had a whole secret team of biologists with me. <laughs> um, I think there's a real... Um, I think that there's a real disconnect between what science is and what people think science is. And that's one of the beauties of this film is that we get to shed some light onto what even funded research looks like. I mean, we had a grant to do this work, and despite that, we were literally, um, you know, waiting patiently when things went wrong and had just barely enough resources to accomplish our research goals. And that was with none of us actually getting paid to do the work with interns on flights to and from Alaska. And um, science is hard and science is personal and science is messy. And so when you get the digested headline, you know, which is almost always wrong anyway, you know, woman talks to whale, um, <laughs> it isn't actually the, the experience of what we go through. And so I'm really grateful to Drew for, for shedding some light on, on the reality. Well, and, and, and as a, I think that was one of the things I realized early on in how I could relate to Ellen and Michelle was it's, it's, I mean, anybody, there's a lot of filmmakers in the audience, um, but anybody, it's just so relatable. It's the same thing. Yeah. You're like hunting down money and you have to start work before necessarily you feel like you have all the money and you just, you risk so much. And you also sacrifice a lot personally. I think the act of leaving home to try and capture stories that feel bigger than you um, at the sacrifice of your own life. Um, I also felt had a lot of parallels in in film and Mish bailed me out I mean uh, technologically I so you know we were out there without any electricity um, or with, without any power grid water or anything like that and we all had these like elect these batteries with like uh, these electric generators basically with solar panels and and every single one of them died every single one <laughs> of them broke and um, at one point uh, I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to finish, you know, filming what's happening to Michelle. And she like rolls up her sleeves and opens up the guts of this thing and sort of like <laughs> has like, oh, I have two spare inverters and like hot wires, everything. And, and yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot to being a scientist. Yeah. Drew tells this story and every time he does, I have to sort of rack my brains to remember that it actually happened because so many things went wrong. <laughs> that the details between what went wrong for Drew and what went wrong for our team have sort of blurred. And I think that that was one of the really beautiful things about this relationship is that Drew became a part of our team. He became someone who we could tell these stories to. And that's not a relationship that I have had with a filmmaker or even anyone else in media before or since. And that was a really quite special change and something that in my community, we are trying to set a precedent for forming more relationships like this one that feel that mutually beneficial and kind and personal between art and science. Um, because if Drew hadn't made the film, then this story wouldn't have gotten out there. So plus he's just a good guy. If his batteries weren't working, somebody should help him. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about that trust, though, Michelle, because clearly um, you're you're dealing with a very compressed timeline and an incredible amount of work. And so, I, I, I mean, did it sound in annoying to have a filmmaker with you on on the boat and um, you know following your team? Yeah, um, I get asked by filmmakers all the time to come out and film our work, and my answer is always the same: it's always no because it stops the work. But Drew did not call me or send me an email and say, hey, I wanna film your work. 
Drew called me and said, hey, I have questions about whales. And I have questions about the ocean. And that set a completely different precedent. And so by the time, I think two years later, by the time Drew came out to actually film the work, um, it wasn't a manner or, or a matter of having a filmmaker in the field with us. We were going to have Drew in the field with us. And that was very different. So had it gone a different way, the answer would have been the same. The answer would have been no. Um, but Drew also really was very sensitive to the stipulations that I gave him, which were many, which were basically like, I'm not going to let you fall off the boat. But other than that, you are absolutely on your own. You have to bring your own water. You have to bring your own fuel. This is how much it's going to cost for you to be on the boat in terms of you weigh, you know, approximately 190 pounds. And that's going to use up an extra gallon and a half of fuel per day. So you'll need to bring that fuel. And I mean, and, and so there was a lot of logistics and a lot of hoops that, that Drew had to jump through so that it wouldn't be an inconvenience for us. And as a result, having him there didn't feel daunting because it was a multi-year trust building exercise. It's amazing. And the result is there on screen, sort of that we're, we're seeing something we really haven't seen before, which is field on the ground field work. And Drew, what was, what was that preparation like for you? And did it resonate with your past feature or, you know, and especially also being alone, your director DP. So you're these, all these images are yours. And I, I'm, I'm curious about that too. Yeah. I, uh, the last film I did, I, for, Yay. Oh, Hey, we can, see, we can see your face. <laughs> Um, the last film I did, uh, because of the subject matter, I, I couldn't have a field producer. I couldn't have a sound recordist. I, I had, and I actually couldn't even have, um, wireless lobs. So it was just like a shotgun mic on the camera. And I got really used to doing that, uh, cause it took me five years. Um, and it so happened to be the most practical thing for fathom too. Um, why uh, there are so many batteries to charge at the end of the day. So like we all slept in tents and I had my, my tent mates were those two generators, just a lot of like buzzing and humming electronics and like a laptop that's like offloading to drives. And I'd have to like set alarms to wake up and like switch out the next drive to like dump things and charge batteries. And, um, so it was, uh, it, this was like the most intense shoot that I've that I've ever done for sure it tested everything um and it's a testament to also like I forget actually this might be a PJ ism PJ Raval I think he's he here. Was here um <laughs> where it's about you know a lot of conversations about like how do you how do you gain trust like how do you convince someone to give you permission to you know film very vulnerable moments in their lives and then um you know, manipulate them and, and, and get, maintain their dignity. Like, how do you gain that trust? And there's a lot of answers to that. But I think you said this, BJ, that there's this like moment a lot of times where um, they see you like schlepping all of the crap you have to schlep and you're like sweating and you're not like filming anything. And there's a moment that often happens where like they realize like, oh my God, they're working really hard and they're sacrificing a lot. And there's something that, sort of clicks in for people in films, I think, that's like, oh, wow. And then they they help you and carry things. I had a lot of gear for this one, so. Yeah. <laughs> I like the parallels between scientific field work and filmmaking field work and, and how that overlaps. Um, so at some point in the film, Dr. Fournay says, um, you know, this is the question I've been preparing for for years. And I, I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that. And, um, you know, I love when you say, you know, it starts here. This is, this is the beginning of a conversation is hello. Um, but tell us a little bit more about um, where the whoop started for you. Sure. When, when I first started studying whales, we didn't have any idea what they sounded like. And that, that's remarkable, given that people have been listening to whales for hundreds of years. But there were sounds that they made in Southeast Alaska that had never been listened to by anyone. And when I said, I want to find out what whales are, are, are saying, first we had to find out quite literally what sounds they even made. And that was only a decade ago that we had that question. I and mean, that is very much within the realm of how long it takes to make some films. And so when we first started cataloging sounds and I heard this sound, I said, is this a humpback? And I kept playing it for people and they're like, oh, we have no idea. Um, but that one sound kept popping up over and over and over. And when something is that persistent, it, it certainly makes itself the, the, the 
the topic of, of further inquiry. I got very curious about it. And then just living with these animals, which is something I've had a real, it's been a real privilege to do. You know, this was a fairly short field season, only one month, but um, I've spent months of my life camping on islands next to whales with hydrophones in the water. And it's a little bit like living with someone who speaks a foreign language. Eventually you begin to understand a little bit, not necessarily what the word means, but what the word is for. And that's how this sort of inquiry into the wolf call came about. I kept hearing the whales say it back and forth to each other and back and forth to each other. And at some point I thought, well, if I say it to them, will they say it back and forth to me as well? And yeah, and 10 years later, here we are. I love the seeing it and Drew captures it so well, the look of wonder that you have when you're in the field and how when you seeing these whales, you like you light up and it's sort of like you spent months and months and years doing this. Um, tell us about that feeling and how it keeps happening for you, even though this is your life. You know, I think I'll I'll say that that's the other big misconception about life as a field biologist is that we get to spend a lot of time in the field. In the same way that Drew spends a small portion of time filming something and a great amount of time editing and working with his team and processing it to make it a film. So the time that is spent turning it into a film is far greater than the time that is spent filming it. That is absolutely true for my work as well. And so the field work is the part that is that keeps me going. It is being with the animals that make the two years of data processing and the politics and the fundraising that makes it worth it. And so if I didn't have those moments of wonder of being in the presence of something that will outlive me, hopefully outlast me, that experiences the world in a completely different way than I do, if I stop having reverence for that interaction, then I would fairly quickly stop doing my job, I would change careers because there would be nothing fueling my fire. Mm -hmm. So that's that moment that you're captured is that fuel. That's, yeah, so beautiful. So tell us if, you're, if you were aware of, um, it seems like there's probably relatively few of you who do this work around the world. Were you aware of Dr. Ellen Garland's research and, um, and what, and can you talk a little bit about the way that you see sort of the connectivity between the culture stuff that she's doing and your, and your work? Yeah, yeah, I very much knew who Ellen was. Um, I've been following her work for my entire career. She's one step ahead of me on the career ladder. So as I was finishing graduate school, she was already sort of stepping into an assistant professor role. And because there really are very few of us that study, that legitimately study communication in, in wild baleen whales. I mean, and you can ask Drew more about this as he was looking for subjects for the film, but it really is a very, quite a small number of us. And so her work is a real foil to mine. She fortunately studies all of the things that I don't, which is wonderful because I, in my mind, they're much too hard. Um, and it gives a real other to what I do. So in a lot of ways, it, in, it inspired me to go down a different path. If there's someone out there that's already studying culture and, and cultural transmission and what male whales are saying and what tropical whales are saying, then I can sort of step in on the opposite side of that and say, what is not cultural? What is innate? What is essential? What is part of the, of the entire repertoire that these whales are saying? Male whales, female whales, baby whales. And that was a really important thing to me. But she has certainly been a role model for me as I've been sort of coming up through my career. And Drew, yeah, that's um, a great follow-up question. Where, what was choosing subjects like and how did that work? And was it, and also the concept of the film, did those things happen? What was the order that those happened in? Yeah, uh, originally I, I just sort of started reading a lot about um, the science of whale cognition and communication and culture. And it sort of put this picture together that was sh stranger than any science fiction I'd ever read or seen on the screen. Um, and, and it occurred to me that if I'm having this much of a emotional reaction to just reading about the work, surely the people on boats who are, um, it must be profound for them. Uh, so then I started, I was just a fanboy to be honest. I was reading papers and like, so I started, uh, I reached out to, uh, Mish through a mutual friend. And then she said, you should come to this conference. It's in Nova Scotia and it's the largest, um, conference dealing with, um, marine mammals in the world it happens every two years. 
Um, so I went there and hung out with whale scientists for a week um, and uh, Michelle among them and got drinks afterward and like talked about like amazing things and they're just the most generous people in the world. They invited me on their boats to go see what they do. But then I realized how truly rare um, Michelle and Ellen are. Like it's really, really hard to get re money to do anything. Um, but I think it's especially hard to convince someone to give you money to go out on a boat and maybe, maybe not come back with anything useful, um, especially like early on in your career and especially as a woman. Um, so they are truly rare breeds. Maybe uh, dying. I don't know if a dying breed, but it's, it's, it's really tough. It's really rough. And I think most of Michelle's colleagues probably, um, so a lot of other people we spoke with, they do go out on boats, they, but they weren't, to me, I wanted, I wanted great scientists first. That was the first, like, you know, criteria do good work, honest work. Um, and two, I wanted people who leave to go do work at sea who are immersed, like physically immersed in it. Um, and it just ended up with, um, Michelle and Ellen, uh, because, uh, well, the third, the other criteria is you have to really like them and they have to really like you because the journey you go on on a film is really personal and difficult and trying. And uh, so I ended up just going because they were my friends. So um, this is my last question and then I'm going to open up to the audience to ask questions because I'm sure there are many. Um, but do you, we see both with your and Dr. Ellen Garland's research, the, the frustrating moments where you may not actually complete the work. Um, and it seems uh, just very daunting, the idea of that you would get out there and be funded and not come back with anything. And so I'm wondering, has that happened? And kind of what, how does that factor into um, how you kind of keep going as a scientist, but also how do you, how do you deal with that emotionally? That is a really hard question. Um, the truth is, I'm still not certain that we have enough data. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether or not the data from this film will be enough to publish as a standalone paper. So the jury is still out as to whether or not it's going to make it through the review process or if we're going to have to go back out and do it again. And that is a major risk that we take in this field. Now, I am savvy enough that I can, I, there's always a contingency plan. So we have already used this data for other things. We have already um, applied this data towards answering other questions that are part of these larger amalgamated data sets. So part of it is being savvy, like knowing that any study you do is going to be useful because you're collecting data and knowing where it fits into the greater sort of puzzle piece, which is my entire research program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's there. But in terms of answering this one question, I, I want to say that we have an answer to this question. I want to say that we're there now, but I just don't know that that's true. And I think one of the things that's hard is that there is the scrutiny of what you know from having been there. And then there's the scrutiny you face from people that don't trust what you know from having been there. Science is very much stratified between human experience and, and, and trying to remove bias. And both of those things are essential for doing good work because the human brain is one of the most complex computers. It is the most complex computer on this planet. And without it, we don't know what questions to ask. But because the data is so difficult to acquire, when you come back and you only have 20 samples and you work in a field that it can be brutal, um, there's going to be someone out there that even if they think 20 samples is enough is going to say, no, go do it again. And that's hard. It's hard to it's hard to know something is true and to still be a part of an institution or a longstanding culture that um, that doesn't always listen to the truth. So it's tricky. It's fascinating. Um, all right, I'll open it up to the to the audience. If for any questions for Dr. Michelle Fournay or Drew, yes. So yes, the question about logistics and travel um, for, for between French Polynesia, Alaska, New York, et cetera. Um, it, was, uh, it was really hard. 
Um, it was, uh, so for Scotland and, uh, New York, um, those shoots were relatively straightforward. It was sort of bouncing to see Michelle to sort of capture some of her prep and going to see Ellen to see how she works with students and, 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 and also their relationships at home, et cetera. But the field seasons lined up so that, um, they actually, there was overlap, but not complete overlap. So I'm jumping in with, so I was with Michelle for like 30 some odd days and then flew straight from Alaska to French Polynesia with Ellen and just it was quite a culture shock like completely different uh everything um so yeah Alaska was crazy it's like you you need like I need to a seaplane to like carry all the gear in me to take us to this little island um and then I show up and they're like oh you have too much stuff you need like a bigger seaplane so we had to like upgrade seaplanes and like fly you know fly there and then on the way out is really hectic because um, they're not going to show up if the weather's bad. So it's and oh, and the whole time I only have a little satellite texting thing with uh, producer Megan Gilbride, who's a huge part of how I was able to do all this stuff. So I'd like text her like, Megan, call the plane in. I've got it. We, you know, and she'd be like, oh, you know, I have to look at the weather. So in fact, actually, I think Michelle and Natalie um, had to. Did you guys have to wait like two days for the plane to come yeah. or the weather to clear? Yeah. Actually we leave. did. Which after like th- after thirty seven days of we ate really well, but you <laughs> but you know Michelle's an amazing like field cook, camp cook, but like uh, we ate really well. But you know you're like really looking forward to home, and your expectations are I'm going to go home, and the weather sours, and minutes feel like weeks. It's just like you're like I just want to get out of here. So anyway, it was a lot of luck and uh, planning and making Gilbride. Austin bread producer, Megan Gilbride. Um, another question I saw right here in the center, and then I'll come to the edge. Yes, in the center, yeah. I kept waiting for the attack of the mosquitoes in Alaska. Did you get really lucky, or...? Ask us, yeah, tell us about the mosquitoes in Alaska. Apparently, um, this, this audience member says he was preparing for the attack of the mosquitoes. Did you Me? get lucky? Mish, or was that was weird gonna... that we didn't have mosquitoes, or is that normal? So we're quite lucky in coastal Alaska in that we don't get as many because there's a sea breeze. So if we had gone interior at all, they would have showed up. Um, but no, um, in southeast Alaska, the mosquito season is really short. If you were to head into Anchorage or Denali or Fairbanks area, then it would have been a completely different experience. And um, we all would have had nets covering our body and looked even weirder. But um, nope, nope, southeast Alaska, it's a place to be. Also, I was worried about, no, I was concerned about bears, and I show up to the island, Misha and the team had been there a few days, uh, or maybe like a week or something before, I, I forget, anyway, before I showed up, and there was this like very controversial poop uh, that, I, that I saw on the <laughs> island, but, and they'd all seen, and I was sure it was bear poop, and Misha's like, it's not bear poop, I'm like, I, I think it's bear poop, I live in Montana, uh, it wasn't bear poop, it was like pygmy deer poop. And for some reason, this island has no mosquitoes or bears. Um, but then I took out, there was an off day where we're kind of giving everyone, a, each other a break and they could go do work. And I took the kayak out and went to the shoreline, which is the mainland, which is maybe like, I don't know, like five swimming pools away. Like it's not super far. And as soon as I pulled up to the shore, there were like giant bear prints all over the sand. But for whatever reason, they don't swim. Or at least you told me they don't swim to the island. Oh, well, they do. Um, <laughs> Conveniently didn't tell Joe about that. <laughs> they didn't have any reason to swim to the island. There was nothing really delicious to eat with us. But, um, oh, yeah, they'll swim from island to island. But we were very fortunate in that there were no bears. Um, I've camped with bears for many, many field seasons. Um, I had a field camp in Glacier Bay National Park where we lived about 100 yards away from a big, big salmon berry thicket. And that was the sort of delineation from where our camp was and where the bears lived. And every day we'd go out and pick berries to make sure that the bears didn't have a reason to come into our camp. So you can safely cohabitate with them, but we were very fortunate in that for this particular field season, we didn't have to. Yes, there's one on the edge and then we'll come back. Yep. Is this the question for Dr. Fournay? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, how has this movie affected your career and your research? Has there been sort of any effect of the film itself on, the, on your work? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I'd say that this film has really positively affected my my career and my research sort of in two ways. Um, one is that as an early career scientist, I've gotten attention that I never would have gotten without this film. Um, I've had some really amazing opportunities to talk to Neil deGrasse Tyson and to go and talk on NPR and to really tell the story of my research in a meaningful way, all because Drew told the story of my research in a meaningful way first. And now I get to sort of be out there and and be a self-advocate. And that's been huge for my work. Um, I get sort of contacted by people out in the world now in a way that I wouldn't have before. And although that's not research related, that is a personal mission of mine, is to connect science and and humanity. And this has absolutely enabled me to connect more fully with non-scientists or people who are interested in science but don't do research themselves. And then on the flip side of that, one of the really tangible things that came out of this is um, I run a small nonprofit called the Sound Science Research Collective, and they actually Sound Science is the one that did this work. This work was not funded by Cornell. It was funded through Sound Science through a grant that we got. And um, somebody saw this film and made a very large donation to keep this research alive. And as a result, we'll be back in the field in 2022, and we will be doing it again. Your big applause for you. Yeah, so thank you, Drew. Uh, thanks, great. Mish. Mish, are you, are, do I have the story wrong before you got the large donation? Wasn't, weren't there two people who watched the film on Apple TV and started like yelling at their television that you didn't have a spare engine and you got like two engines <gasps> donated? Yeah, yeah, that's true too. Um, we have a small boat that we're getting um, after Christmas that somebody bought for us and, um, and somebody else who was just beside himself that the engine broke um, has pledged to buy us a new engine in April. So both of those things are underway. So new boat, new engine, and another field season. That's really exciting. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge that in the audience is uh, Hannon Townsend who did the score for the movie. Mm. Alongside Sam Lippman, who uh, mixed the score, uh, and uh, and Brad Engelking, who's responsible for how the movie sounds, which I'm, as a cinematographer, I'm more proud of the sound than anything else. So, thank you. Both. You all did such amazing work. Thank you for shouting them out. I'm mm-hmm. so thrilled they're all here today. Um, yes, your question in the center, ma'am. Um, great question. So she was really blown away by the difference between your experience in Alaska where you're seeing more whales than you ever had and Dr. Garland's experience where she wasn't seeing any whales. And this audience member was wondering how, what if climate had to do with that and also just in general um, sort of how you're planning and, and what you're thinking about in terms of climate affecting your ability to do the research and sort of what's next. Yeah, those are great questions. So um, this field season occurred in 2019. In 2015, we saw a massive decline in humpback whales in Southeast Alaska. And in 2016, it went even further down. In 2017, it went even further down. 2018, it stayed stable. And for the first time since that crash, 2019, the whales came back. And that's a really important story. And you're right, that is a climate story. The reason we think that our whale population, which had been steadily increasing every year from 1976 until 2015, the reason that we had this crash that took us back down to numbers that we hadn't seen since the 80s was because of warm water in the North Pacific associated with with climate change. It impacted the food supply. And as a result, we've had fewer calves, we've had emaciated whales, and this in a species of whale that we just took off the endangered species list. It was the same year that we delisted them that we saw this crash. And I think what it really shows is that even robust, resilient species like humpback whales are very sensitive to these massive changes. And I mean, this was our great conservation success story. And in a matter of years, we, we changed that story. But it also means that as humans, we need to be doing the research. We have to be out there because if we hadn't been watching these animals and we hadn't been counting these animals, we wouldn't have known. We would have patted ourselves on the back and said, what a great job, well done, and moved on. And 
so I, I think that the nuances of behavior are the first thing that changes. Before a population will crash, before an animal will get stressed, the very first observable change is a change in behavior. And that's why I study behavior. That's why I want to know what the whales are doing and why the whales are doing it, so that hopefully we can prevent problems instead of trying to solve problems. And that is where the research is going, is to keeping to understand what disturbance looks like, what a healthy population looks like, how do the whales act when they're not in trouble. Great. All right, I'm going to take just two more. I'll take this one in the back and then come over here. Yes. All right, let me see if I can try and compress this question. I, um, so t did you hear it? Um, yeah, I, that, one I, that one I could hear. Oh, um, wow, okay. About, yeah, <laughs> so the answer is not at all. Um, Ellen and I had never worked together and never really met until working on this film. So there hasn't been a collaboration to compare um, what she's finding, which is transmitted through learning, and what I've been finding. Um, what we know through research that I've done over the past 10 years is that some sounds whales are born with. And those are the sounds that I study. So whoops are, are innate. Every whale worldwide produces them. Whereas Ellen is, is studying something that is constantly evolving and constantly changing. Um, but singers will certainly impact young whales and female whales and baby whales and that they're all in the same space. They can certainly hear each other. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the motivating force behind what the whales are saying when they're not singing. In fact, it appears to be quite the opposite. It's these foundational calls that are strung together in these new creative ways to form this sort of cultural song. Mm -hmm. um, and then song is shared, but just among male whales mm -hmm. and just adult male whales. And, and even then, not, not only just adult male whales, just some of the adult male whales. Mm -hmm. So if you actually look at the whole system of communication, which generally we think of as humpback whales sing, and that's what they do. But song is actually only a fairly small portion of, of the communication that humpback whales are participating in. So rather than saying how does song influence calling behavior, the question then gets flipped on its end and saying how do calls inform song? And that's something that we're just now starting to work with. And because of this film, the hope is that Ellen and I will be able to collaborate on some of these things moving forward. Amazing. Uh, yes, there was one over here. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that's a really great question. And, and what I can tell you is that we spent literal years designing those sounds so that they would sound absolutely as natural as possible and as if they were supposed to be in that ecosystem. So the sounds themselves were recorded by whales in Southeast Alaska in the exact same habitat where we played them back. And so the individuals that made those sounds came from that region. So we weren't playing a synthesized sound. It wasn't like we made a robot sound. We didn't make a robot whale and play that to the ocean. We actually took the voice of a whale, recorded it very close range, extracted all of the noise and got rid of it and played back a crystal clear recording of a whale itself. And the reason that we picked this sound is because it is so very common. 
And so over the course of a day, a humpback whale is likely to hear that sound probably a hundred times. And we played it 10 times each. And the whole goal was not to change the whale's knowledge, not to alter their behavior, but simply to engage them in a way that they would naturally be engaging anyway. And that partially is an ethical decision. Um, we had, and this didn't make it into the film for which I'm quite glad, we were also doing playback of another sound, which is a feeding call. And that was part of the original experimental design. And this particular call only occurs when animals are foraging on Pacific herring in big schools. And when we played it, the whales quite abruptly stopped what they were doing. So they stopped eating and they turned and they all swam and surrounded our boat. And they were looking for a school of fish that wasn't there. And while this was beautiful to see and we got right next to the whales and, and they're, I guess in some cases people would have jumped up and down about how cool that was. I was really mortified by it. And it was a extremely troubling circumstance because we had lied to the whales and it changed their behavior and that behavior had consequences and that they burned calories to come look for food that wasn't there. And based on that, I, I ended up canceling that part of the study. And not only that, but I ended up writing letters to the permitting agencies saying that that needs to be a permitted activity and it needs to be prohibited for exactly the reason that you're talking about. Because in my mind, there is very, very little justification in negatively altering the behavior of a wild animal. Um, and so I, I can assure you that we spent an enormous amount of time making sure that the experience that the whales had was as non-invasive, non-threatening um, as it possibly could have been, and that it would have burned negligible amount of calories and wouldn't have changed their behavior in any kind of significant way. Okay, we're going to do one last question, if anybody has a last one. Otherwise, I'm going to... Yes. Oh, we got a couple. Okay, yes, right here. It, it is very, very, very rare. In human history, I think it's happened less than a dozen times, and that's in all of recorded human history. The only time that a, you would get your boat capsized by a whale is because you had made a human error. A whale would not actively come over and interfere with your boat in a meaningful way, but if you happen to position your boat directly above a surfacing whale, then it wouldn't be able to see you. It wouldn't know you were there, especially if your engine is off. Your engine is off. You don't exist in the water. They don't know where you are. They can't see you. And, um, and then alternatively, if you come between a cow and her calf, you are in a dangerous situation. And, um, but so long as you adhere to those two rules, which is if a boat is near you, knock on the bottom of your boat so it knows you're there. Um, give, in general, give them lots and lots of space and, um, and don't get in between a cow and a calf, then, then the whales are actually no threat to you. Um, if you were in the water with a whale, which I never recommend, um, I, I think there are very few reasons to ever get in the water with a, with a, with a wild whale, um, then you run the risk of, of getting injured at it because they're inquisitive, because they're curious. So we're talking about an animal that's 40 feet long and weighs 90,000 pounds. That pectoral fin is 15 feet long and weighs 8,000 pounds. So if it brushes you with it, it'll send you straight down to the bottom of the ocean. Or if it accidentally tips you with the edge of its flukes, it will throw you 40 or 50 feet and break any bones. So it's not that the whales are aggressive at all. They're not. Um, it's mostly just that the sheer size of them makes them dangerous. And so the best thing that we can do is stay out of their way. But no, very rare for a boat to get capsized by a whale. Drew, what is next for you after this wonderful film? Uh, that's a great question. I, um, I'm, a, I'm in a spot right now. I'm, I'm reading a lot again, uh, about, uh, different subjects and, um, it's hard to tell if it's reading for pleasure. If I'm researching the next film, it's exactly where I was four years ago with fathom. I was reading a lot about whales and just enjoying it. So I'm sort of following that same instinct and following my nose. But I think the I know the next film is going to go, I want to go deeper with a lot of the fundamental themes and ideas in Fathom. Um, like to me, it's about words like 
uh, intelligence, emotion, communication, um, that for the longest time were what defined what it is to be a human being. And what I loved about what really drew me to the work that Michelle and Ellen do is that it's, it subverts that. And, and instead of it being what makes us exclusive and unique, it actually is what connects us to everything. And I, mm-hmm. for me, what I want to continue to do with film is to use it to ex- expand how we think of ourselves, which is really scary and humbling and, and uncomfortable. Um, so I want to do that um, with the next piece too, and uh, so yeah, that's all I know for now. Dr. Michelle Fernay, I've learned so much from you today. Thank you so much for joining us and our audiences oh. in Austin. We're so thrilled to have you virtually. So thank you for taking. Yeah. Your time. Of and, course, thank you so much for having us. And thank you, Drew, um, for being here. And thank you all for joining us at Doc Days. We're so thrilled to have such a great audience for this movie. Oh, one quick thing. Uh, I have. Um, no, it's okay. I have a bunch of posters, and the only here I'll show it real quick. They're, uh, they're really beautiful. They're, re- they're real posters. The way you know it's a real poster is um, the back is an exact reflection of the front, um, and I have a bunch of them. And uh, if anybody sincerely would put it on a wall in your home or somewhere else, um, I, I'd give them to you. Um, so. Uh, hit, hit me up afterward, and uh, and we'll talk about it. But um, thank you all for being here. It's so nice to see your faces. <laughs>